and it's a great honor to finally be here uh, at an event at the Colo. So, without further ado, I uh, want to introduce our uh, guest speaker, our keynote, um, Shira Applebaum Moreski, um, who is a paramedic with Magandavita Dome. Uh, in addition to being a nurse uh, with Terran Clinics, she will tell her story. And then, this is a, a great opportunity for everybody here to ask first hand questions of a paramedic in terms of uh, what she's spoken about, but also in terms of um, what it's like to be a paramedic, how the system um, operates, any questions you may have. Uh, including how our uh, how our ambulance functions in the real life scenario, because uh, Vancouver has already donated one community ambulance, a uh, mobile intensive care unit, which is the, the premier class of uh, ambulance with the most life saving equipment on it. Um, but anyway, hand over the floor. Mohaba, thank you for coming. And yesterday, beautiful, beautiful city. I'm definitely coming back. <laughs> My name is Shira Apuba Moroski, Israeli born and raised. I have a paramedic station in Magenda Vida Dome, Jerusalem. I have a bachelor's in emergency medicine and a, mass, and a master's in mass casualty and disaster management from Ben Gurion University in Be'er Sheva. I've been a part of Magenda Vida Dome for about five years. A year and a half ago, I joined the Magenda Vida Dome National Disaster Response Team and trained with the Norwegian Red Cross to be part of a field hospital emergency response unit. I work as an ambulance driver and an instructor as well. Wednesday, March 23rd, about two months ago, after a busy night shift on the intensive care unit and little sleep, I went to my second job at Tarim, a private emergency medical clinic founded by my father, Dr. David Applebaum, over 20 years ago, located across the street from the new upcoming Magenta Vida Dom station in Jerusalem. The truth is, I was so exhausted that I was just waiting for 3 o'clock to come so I can go home and sleep before the next night shift. I usually don't work so many consecutive shifts, but since my husband was away on a business trip, I decided to keep myself busy with doing my favorite activity, work. It was getting close to 3, and I was getting ready to go home, when suddenly a familiar atmosphere of urgency filled the air. Within seconds, Sirens start, started sounding, and my pager started to beep continuously. The message reads, Mass casualty event, explosion by Central Bus Station in Jerusalem. All medics and paramedics rush to the scene. Be cautious, fear of second explosion. Thinking back, it's hard to specify how you know that, there's, that there has been a pigua, a terrorist attack. You just know, and then you just act as you're trained. There's no thought process, only actions. I immediately started running down the stairs to the main Magenda Vida Dome station where I got a ride with a mobile intensive care unit to the explosion site. A busy location at all times of the day, which was literally a 40 second drive. There was a bus with broken windows, but not totally burnt. Thank God, I thought, the bomb wasn't on the bus. And then, the chaos that we know so well begins. Ambulances, private cars, first responders on motorbikes, police, bomb squads, military forces, and firefighters all flood the scene. Although we arrived at the scene within a little over a minute, there were medics, soldiers, and civilians that just happened to be there during the explosion, treating the wounded as best as they could, and helping us carry the patients to the ambulances. In the corner of my eye, I can see Hanan, doing CPR, CPR on an older woman. Immediately, an ambulance approaches and stops right next to them. The back door is open, the ambulance bed gets pulled out. Within seconds, Hanan, the injured woman, and two more volunteers are in the ambulance and on the way to the hospital. I hear my name being called, and when I turned around, Yosef, a paramedic that just moved to Jerusalem from New Jersey, not, that just, not long ago, is bending down near an injured man not, from, not far away from the explosion site. I can see a bleed up by his upper thigh and his abdomen seems injured. I run to him and see that he is conscious. I instruct a volunteer to dress and put pressure on the bleeding spot. Another ambulance stops right near us. Again, the back door is open, the ambulance bed gets pulled out, and they're on the way to the hospital. Ambulances come and go, and with every blink of my eye, more patients are taken to the hospital. Everything happens so fast and in an automatic mode. 
<coughs> Four minutes after the explosion, all critically injured patients were already on their way to the hospital, receiving first life treat, first response treatment from the ambulance crew. This quick and efficient response is unfortunately a result of a, the vast experience that Magenta Vida Dom Jerusalem has had with mass casualty events throughout the years. The scene is scanned to make sure no one is left behind. A couple of ambulances stay in the area until the scene is totally empty. Ten minutes after the explosion, the dispatcher already gives a chazlash order. Chazlash stands for chazara l'shigra, which means back to routine. Life is back to normal. Of course, not for the 38 people who were injured and the 49-year-old woman who was killed. The injured have just started their sometimes long passage to recovery. Life won't really go back to normal for hundreds of bystanders who might not know this yet, but will remember this day for the rest of their life. Nor for any of the emergency staff personnel, every mass casualty event leaves a little scar, leaves a memory, and leaves lessons learned for the events to come. I went home, showered, and watched the news I even caught a few hours of sleep before my next night shift. So how did I, Shira, end up in this line of work? Tuesday, September 9, 2003, almost eight years ago, I was sitting in my house doing last minute preparations for my sister's wedding the next day. My father and sister went to a coffee shop to pick up some coffees for the whole family while we stayed at home, continue, continued working on the seating plans. Suddenly, I heard a blast, and seconds later, the sirens. I had a bad feeling, and the breaking news proved my worries right. The bomb was at Café Hillel, where my father and sister had gone. My brother Yitzhak and I ran to the car and were at the scene within minutes. While looking for our father and sister, we saw injured and dead people laying all over the place. I remember when I arrived at the scene, I felt helpless. I felt like I had to do something, to help somehow, and try to save someone, but I couldn't. I didn't know how. My father, Rabbi Dr. David Applebaum, was the director of emergency room in Shari Tzedek Hospital, as well as the director of Terem. Terem is a chain of private emergency medical clinics in Jerusalem, founded by my father. He worked in Magen David Adom for many years, after moving to Israel from Cleveland, Ohio, back in 1981, after having finished his residency in emergency medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital. My older sister, Nava, spent every waking moment helping and entertaining young cancer patients as part of her national services. Her biggest dream was to find a cure for cancer. I lost both of them that night, my father and my older sister. After that dreadful night, I decided I never wanted to feel helpless again. I decided to continue in their footsteps and devote the rest of my life to saving lives. I'd like to pause at this time to detail a few of my father's innovations at Magen David Adom. When my father made Aliyah to Israel, he approached the Jerusalem Magen David Adom chief looking for employment. After a one-day trial, he was assigned to operate, staff, and later become head of the first mobile intensive care unit in Jerusalem and the medical director of Magen David Adom Jerusalem. He introduced a constant review of medical practice and an assessment of quality of care. He revolutionized the, the mobile intensive care units, bringing Magen David Adom services into the 21st century. My father conceived and developed a system in which streptokinase is administered by a physician-led team in an ambulance before reaching the hospital, a system which has saved many lives. Streptokinase is a medication that dissolves clots and is given to patients that are going through a heart attack. This was the first time that streptokinase was given in a pre-hospital environment. He helped write the paramedic training curriculum and he taught the paramedic trainees. He suggested and pushed for adding automated external defibrillators on the regular basic life support ambulances. And still today, these automated external defibrillators play a critical role in saving lives of patients with cardiac arrest without needing to wait for the mobile intensive care units. 
I have vivid memories how often during off hours when my, father, when my father's pager went off, he was at the door within seconds. Whether it was to a car accident, a heart attack, a heart attack patient, or a terrorist attack. During the day, the late hours of the night, and on Shabbat and Chagim. There's a saying, choose a job you love and you'll never have to day, work a day in your life. I truly believe that I'm exactly where I belong. And I just maybe Confucius wrote that saying about me. The day-to-day -day life in Magenta Vida Dome is hard. It can be very stressful as well. We work long hours for little pay in the heat, the rain, and the snow, carrying patients, doing chest compressions, and really breaking up a sweat. With all the difficulties, physical and emotional, I honestly believe that working as a paramedic is the most fulfilling job ever, and it's all because of the miracles. The little newborn baby taking his first breath of air in your bare hands. The 39-year-old whose chest you pumped for over 40 minutes and a week later walks himself out the hospital. The car you see on the side of the road all bashed up, preparing to see the worst when two 18-year-old kids crawl out with nothing but a scratch. Holding a healthy baby in your arms and remembering that when you shut up in his house three weeks ago, just two weeks after he was born, his heart stopped beating, and no one thought there was a chance he'd survive. No matter the age, the race, or the religion of our patient, the lives that are saved, the miracles are what keep me and all the Magenta Vida Dom family excited and passionate about coming to work every day. Magenta Vida Dom, you might know, is a very special organization. Our staff includes a combination of workers, trainees, and volunteers as well as a combination of Jews, Muslims, and Christians. We all get along really well. Really, it's not just a cliche. It's the only place I know of in Israel where there's really no tension between the Jews and the Arabs, the ultra-Orthodox and the secular. When we put on this uniform and we enter an ambulance, all other issues are irrelevant. We focus completely on our work and on having fun in the process. Since I became a Magenta Vida Dome worker, I've been told countless stories of my father from my fellow EMTs, paramedics, and doctors that worked on my father's side. They tell me how my father was loved, appreciate, appreciated, and honored as a teacher, as a friend, and as a team member. When I hear these stories, I feel proud and try, and try to learn from him through my colleagues who worked with him when I was just a little kid. People often ask me, how I'm able to go to a bombing site after what I've been through. If the sight of a coffee shop after a terrorist attack or the sirens of an ambulance throw me back to my own personal tragedy. And my answer is always no, absolutely not. What I have learned from my own tragedy is that there are things that are not in my hands to change. I could not have stopped the terrorists from attacking the coffee shop on the evening when my father and sister were killed. I cannot stop the car accidents, the heart attacks, the seizures, these are facts that only God can control and understand. But when my pager goes off, when I'm called to a help as a Magenta Vida Dome paramedic, I know that God has given us the opportunity to change, to make a change. That someone out there needs our help. Someone is waiting for me or one of my colleagues to treat their life-threatening condition, to deliver their baby, or to just take away the pain. This is in our hands to change. Literally, this is our chance to make this world better, to stop someone else from hurting. This is our chance to help save a life. Perhaps I was wrong. When I hear the sirens or get called to a site with many casualties, I actually do think of my father, but I do not think of him at his last moment. I think of how well and efficient he would have handled this crisis, and his memory pushes me to become the most dedicated, passionate, and focused paramedic that I'm capable of being. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to share my personal experience with you. I wish you all health, peace, and thank you very much.
What's the percentage of uh, Muslims and Christians who are working with you, more or less? I'd say around 15%. 15? Yeah. Some of them do a international service as well, right? Yes, we have um, some uh, Muslims or Christians that don't do the army service. Instead, they come to Magenda Vida Dome and they do a year of like uh, national service like girls do, like religious girls do. And they volunteer for a whole year. They run ambulances every day. I have a second question. Sure. Uh, your master in emergency, what's, what's it exactly? In, in mass casualty event and disaster management. It's the only master of its kind in Israel? or There are two programs. There's also a program in Tel Aviv University. Is there anything in North America as far as you know? Columbia. That's, it. that's, that's what I've heard. Our, um, the director of the program in Ben Gurion University got his doctorate in Columbia. Professor Ashkenazi. So people st study first. What do they study for the BA? Well, my bachelor's is in emergency medicine. That's where I was trained to be a paramedic. And um, the master's is, a, is following oh. that, um, that bachelor's. But you can come with anything. You can be a nurse. You can be, I had nurses. I had doctors. Um, I had, um, I had uh, security. People were in charge of security in different, uh, in like small communities, in settlements. In your profession in Israel, do most people, is it a, like a lifelong career or is there a burnout period that, you know, people only last 10, 15 years or something like that? Most of the paramedics that work in Magenda Bin Adom now are paramedics for over 10 years. There are some people that, that sometimes it gets hard for them and they find a different job, but most of the paramedics are, have been there for a long time. Okay. Yeah. It's a great job. It's hard, but it's really fun. Very fulfilling, I suppose. Very fulfilling. Yeah. I have a question about your uh, adopted uncle. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, okay. To tell the story? Sure. Um, at the evening of the bombing in Cafe Hillel, where my father and sister were killed, there was a, there was a story in the newspapers that uh, two Arab doctors went to, uh, went to the scene to. What's the word? Mizahot. To identify my father. These two doctors are, one is a Muslim and one is a Druze. They work in Terem, in the clinic that my father founded, and worked in Magenda Vidadom as well, on the mobile intensive care units. I know them since I'm a little kid, and they're part of my family, even though they're Arabs. And um, everyone was very surprised that the people who came to identify my father were, were Arabs on the night of the, of the explosion. They're like family. We work together happily. It's possible. It is. It's possible for sure. Yeah. Is it hard people well? Yeah, it's always hard. You see car accidents and people that are really injured. It's very hard, but you think of the think of the goal. You try to help them, so you don't really think about everything around. Uh, so you've been to, to the Terum clinics, all of them, and uh, it's tremendous the efficiency and uh, the fact you can't get much done in Shabbat. You said you could get everything done there. It's a, a great blessing. Yeah, well, in Terem, on Shabbat, all the staff is non is not Jewish. Yeah, that's right. So there's no problem for anyone to come and get um, any medical treatment that might not be emergency, like, right, might not be an emergency, but there's no problem with breaking the Shabbat. So all the staff is is non Jewish on Shabbos. Right. An excellent staff, by the way. Right now, it contains me, my brother, and my sister. We all work there. And my older brother. So it's like a family. What about your husband? Excuse me? What about your husband? He also works there? No. No? He's a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, he's, my whole family is in the medical profession besides him. That's OK. We need some change. Yeah? What's your thought on, on, on one that how a person should react when life is not in your hand. 
Sorry, can you What's your thought on a person, on how should a person react when life uh, escapes your hands? Well, like, you, try your, you try your best not to let it escape. But if you let it escape, it's, it's, it, I guess it just wasn't meant to be. There's someone else who makes the plans. And we just try to help and keep life as much as we can. Is it hard for you to disconnect from your job in your home? Right now, while I'm here? No, I mean oh, when I, when I go home? Um, not really. Um, I get home and I take my uniform off, but... Um, I still talk to my friends from work, and how was your day, and what did you have, and what did you learn from the different calls that you had, and we hang out. All the, all the, all my colleagues were very, very good friends, so it sort of comes home with you, but sometimes you need to just disconnect and talk about other things, just so you have a little bit of a break. Do you see yourself being a paramedic in 10 years, 20 years from now? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, we have in, in Magenta Vila Dom, we have a lot of women that are paramedics, that are ambulance drivers, most of them are also religious, so it's, you might have to take some breaks, I hope, but um, yeah, you have volunteers, they help you, you don't have to carry, they're gentlemen sometimes. Yeah, sorry. I know that recently there's been some issues with uh, the whole uh, medical system in Israel and doctors kind of having problems uh, coping with, uh, with pressure. Has that at all affected um, again, the Vida Dome and if it has, um, how do you guys cope with it and what are the kind of challenges that you're facing, you know, under, I guess, um, under funding and all those issues? Um, well, it doesn't really um, affect us because we're, we're, not, we're not related to the doctors. But we do have um, a mobile intensive care unit with a doctor every shift. So now it's a problem because it's sort of hard to staff that, that ambulance. Um, but other than that, we're totally independent. We have nothing to do with the doctors. And um, that's, why, but that's why they're paramedics. So if the doctors can't come, then we can do sort of part of their job, at least the beginning of it. So are, you, are you solely funded by donations, or there's yeah. any government? Just by donation. No, there's some, there's some oh, government, but there's oh, there not there. Sorry, he knows those things. Oh, the percentage would be like 5, 10 percent? I don't, I don't want to misquote, so I'm not sure. But I will tell you that it's kind of a leap of faith. The government basically figures that, uh, you know, they'll contribute a little something. And uh, the, the, the rest of the world will, will kick it in. And okay. it's very much a leap of faith for the balance. Yeah. And then there's some, some things like there's just, in, so the Wish Ambulance, for example. That's something that's, that's like completely donated. over and above that the government would be thought of that project. That's just people who got creative and said, you know what, it's great to save a life, but we also need to kind of preserve life till the very, very end, even if there is a coming end. That's a, a magnificent project. And that's all donated. All donated. It. All donated. Part of it is a matter of tradition, simply because this charity is one of the main charities in the country. And it was before the country. It's an older charity than the state itself. So when you have something that's working, that's something. It's a very essential service, but it's already being, so, so to speak, taken care of by donations. That the government just has, uh, just runs into security, police, and all that. But, but most of the most of the budget comes from donations, especially for equipment. All the ambulances are donated, are, are bought from donations. The only services that Magenta Vida don't provides for money is at little settlements in towns. Sometimes yeah. the services are leased out, but also it's not part of the government. Actually, it's, it's a little bit like a it's crown. a municipality. Of the, it's, a crown it's a little bit like a crown corporation. <coughs> I'm curious, how does uh, Enda Vida Dome uh, interact with the Red Cross? Sometimes it, in, in Israel, whenever you turn to them, or the Red or the Red Crescent. Crescent. Yeah. Um, so in 2005. Magenta Vida Dome became part of the Red Cross, the International Red Cross. Um, we were trained by them, and that's how we have our National Disaster Response Team. And we train with them. So um, members of the National Disaster Response Team are sent to Red Cross um, 
Red Cross in different countries. So I went to the Norwegian Red Cross and I was trained as a field hospital um, emergency response unit member. And we sent them to different countries to do different um, emergency response units. And with the Red Crescent, um, we work sometimes together with them. If they um, need to bring a patient into the country, and they can't, I mean into the country, or into the Israeli borders, we meet them at the um, checkpoints and we take the patients from them, we treat their patients and we take them, if they need to go into Palestinian, um, pro uh, Palestinian borders, then they can pick them up from the checkpoints. And um, I think a month ago, we trained together with the Jordanian Red Cross, because we are uh, we're waiting for an earthquake to come, so we're training for it. And there, um, the area that by, by the Dead Sea, by Yamamela, is, is uh, Jordanian and Israeli territory together. So we trained together um, to build an IDP camp, an in-displaced persons camp. And we worked, it was a whole drill together. We, we had dinner together, we were there two days, and they taught us how to build the, the tents that they bring. And we taught them how, to, how we take care of mass casualty incidents. So we have protocols of working together in case of a disaster that will be in the area that we work together. Yeah. There's a, another service of Magan David Adon that I, I didn't know about until I saw a YouTube video of a, a Haitian professional dancer who lost his legs in the earthquake and, and apparently MDA fitted him with prostheses and then and went through the whole um, rehabilitation process to train him. And he's back dancing professionally again today. Can you tell us more about that, that well, rehabilitation? Well, that, that, um, that was a service that was out. It wasn't it then belonged to Magenda Viradom, but Magenda Viradom, um, I heard the story as well, they, they took that guy and they um, coordinated, what coordinated I with, with this other company uh, that were taking care of, of prostates. This is for Roy. Oh. How are we doing on our fundraiser for a second? <laughs> um, okay, so just to detract for a moment, sure. Uh, we have one. So there's a couple of ambulances from Greater Vancouver already in service. There's one in Kalmiel, which was funded by a family uh, on the North Shore. There's one that was, there's a guy who uh, was living in Vancouver uh, very, very modestly his whole life. People sort of felt a little bit too modestly, and he was kind of saving and scrounging. And when he died, he donated all his money for an ambulance, so he could scrounge while living in order to, to benefit him when he died. Uh, his uh, name is um, Mossy, remember his last name? Raphael. Raphael. Mossy Raphael. Uh, so I always like to tell his name because, you know, you can never judge a person. He could be sort of appear like a miser, and yet he's saving up for something bigger and better, so that's amazing. He uh, died at Louis Gar and then he donated his ambulance. Uh, to Modi'in, and it was actually a dedication. His family is partly in the UK and partly here in the British Ambassador to Israel. It's actually a, a dedication of the um, We have our own community ambulance, and when I say our own, we have another one that we got through broadly based mom and pop donations. So five bucks here, ten bucks there. That took us two and a half years. Uh, and it's up and running and circulating in Tel Aviv, and I have some stats on the numbers of uh, casualties and the types of calls it's been on, if you guys are interested after. Sure, about you mention how much the ambulance is. Oh, but it's $125,000 when the exchange rate is favorable, otherwise it's 130. But so right now the exchange is yeah, it's a lot of moms and pop. Um, and we're about halfway through our uh, second broadly based community ambulance. And uh, just one other tidbit on that, and I'll return to share is the doors on our ambulances. We, uh, we're really fortunate today as a kind of a, a community of communities here. We have uh, people from the Jewish community, we have people from the Christian community, and that's one of the really cool things about tonight is that it's a gathering. And uh, because there was really very strong participation from both sides, we uh, went to our Christian friends and we said, well, here's a door. You get to dedicate whatever you want on, on, on the door so that they can uh, have a really an equal share in it. And so one door uh, was chosen to be dedicated uh, to the staff and volunteers of Lincoln and Dome, and I have a screenshot of the door. And the other one is dedicated to the unit from uh, our very first guest speaker. Um, uh, 
the MIA uh, missing, search and rescue missing in action, and then those are our two posts in action. So, a uh, long, long answer to say about halfway through the other, our second broadly based. How many evidences are you sustaining? Uh, Vancouver or abroad? Uh, abroad. Worldwide. It's a good question. Yeah. Mr. Feingold gave us a number. I know it was 900. I, uh, I don't know the answer, but I can get back to you. I don't want to give the wrong answer. No. So, um, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Good number. Um, but yeah, the, the, the interesting thing is, of course, all the, all the sexy stuff is to buy a brand new spanking ambulance, which is well, but there's there's a lot of maintenance costs in the existing ones, insurance, wear and tear on the tires, fuel, all that kind of stuff. Equipment inside. Uh, equipment inside, yeah. So our ambulance, that $125,000 figure, actually didn't include the uh, defibrillator. It's a wireless defibrillator that's supposed to be like super snazzy, incredible. It makes, and that it alone, makes life easy. Yeah, maybe you can talk about that, because that itself is 30000 more. Um, so it's, uh, it's a defibrillator that has also a monitor, has an EKG, um, it has a blood pressure, everything is, is electronic, and it basically is wireless. So you can have a patient with all the wires on him with a little unit, and you can take him down the stairs without having to push in between the railing and the chair and falling and slipping, and you can hold it like around one floor down and you can still see how your patient's doing. It makes life much easier. The other cool supply story, which I really like, is um, it was in the slideshow there. So uh, people of the Netherlands are relatively a smaller country with fewer donations versus, say, Canada and the United States. Um, and again, we did almost having trouble with sort of the less sexy projects, uh, the supplies that are less uh, uh, less attractive when you say to people, like with rubber gloves, and you walk up to a donor and you say, I'd like uh, 18 bucks for 100 rubber gloves. It's not exactly the same sort of impression as saying you have a share in the ambulance. So what they did was they did a marketing flow where they said, okay, well what we're going to do is we're going to make rubber gloves our national project. And every blue glove, rubber glove that you see being used on the enemy of the Dome in Israel comes from the Netherlands. And they like that marquee that if you see a rubber glove, <coughs> you pay for it, which I think is a really cool twist. <coughs> Depends what you want to do. If you're a paramedic, it takes three years in university, or you can do it without a bachelor's degree, and then it's a year and eight months. And there are volu there are volunteers that do different courses. So the first course is a 60-hour course, which is done after grade nine. It's a 60-hour course during school vacation, and then there's a 90-hour course, and there's a driving course, which is. 200, 200 hours, 220 hours, and then there is the that's, the, that's the medic and driver course. So it depends what you want to do, but you can do 60 hours and you can still go on the ambulance and become a volunteer. And the Vietnam actually has a program for people from other countries that can go volunteer in Israel to work on the ambulance as period students. So right after high school, where you get to university, on that program and they'll train you. All you need to know is how to speak Hebrew. And if you don't know that, you can take some basic courses they have. Basic. Yeah, basically they have full time that they can send you to. And then they'll train you. It's a 10 day course, I think, to start with. And that gives you a certain level. If there are, if there are problems, how are they dealt with? Um, well, we have ambulances there as well. Right. And they are bulletproof. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> We take care of a patient no matter what, if there's a car accident. There was a car accident this week with, um, by, by the settlement, which is on the West Bank. And there were Palestinian um, injured and injured Jews. And we take care of both of them equally. Same, same. Okay, we treat them, we take them to our hospitals if they're critically injured. Unless um, they're known, if they're not allowed to come into the country for some reason. And then we take them to a uh, hospital um, in, uh, in the West Bank. And we work together with the Red Crescent so they can take a patient as well. We have bulletproof ambulances, yes. So 
Have you ever been attacked by a um, An ambulance was attacked in Jerusalem. They were lynched and burnt. <laughs> Yeah, there's a picture on Noni's wall of yeah. an ambulance that's completely a um, There was a driver inside with a volunteer, and then they were coming to a call in the uh, Muslim quarter. It was a, during the first intifada, and when they came, um, lots of um, hostile people were banging on the ambulance, and, and eventually they lit it. They lit it up, but they got out because one of the volunteers of Magenda Viradom that lived in the Muslim quarter, an Arab, um, helped them out. He rescued them from the ambulance. So there's been rocks and there's been things like that, but it's just for our protection. So interesting side coming down with the Canadian angle. A couple of years ago, so Magenda Viradom was equipping its paramedics with all of her vests, helmets, all sorts of stuff against that. And a couple of years ago, somebody, Canadian resident, filed a petition through uh, one of the commissions of the CRA and filtered up through the courts and they were trying to deny again to be the dominant tax charitable status because the argument was that we were funding military equipment like both vests and helmets. And for a brief moment in time, the government did in fact suspend our charitable status until we fought it in court and we won. Um, but uh, it's, it's very dicey for us right now. We're in Canada, mind you, under the current administration, things are a little safer, uh, but it's still it's still a, a problem. So what again, the Vietnam in Canada has decided to do to kind of go more with that is to stay away from that. There's plenty of things that we can fund, and so the American friends or some other uh, uh, countries are funding that just to uh, get away from that. But it's a reality that that's part of the equipment uh, that needs to happen. Now we always tell this story how uh, we lost the charitable status because supposedly one of the one of the points that was made that we're supplying arms or armor because the uh, bulletproof vest is somehow uh, considered armament. But what's interesting, what's really interesting this year about this story is that now Canadian uh, paramedics have vests. <laughs> but it's mature to understand that that's sometimes required for a paramedic even though he doesn't carry a vest. We don't wear them all the time. We only wear them when there's a shooting incident or in Zerot. Every time there's a, uh, a missile attack, they have to wear them in that area. But we don't wear them all the time. They're in the ambulance. Yeah, you're my best student. <laughs> Stand up and then say it out loud. Oh, which injured per people we take first? Um, so the, we take the most injured, but that have a chance to live. Because in a bombing uh, inside a building, if someone's really, really critically injured and is already dead, then we're not going to start CPR on that patient, but we'll take the next patient who might have a chance to survive. But thank God, in Jerusalem, there are so many ambulances that come so fast that all the critically injured people are taken, are taken really, really fast. So we don't, usually we don't have to think about that so much. Which, I mean, it's unfortunate, but, but it's, it's just from practice and from yeah. having so many bombings. Okay. Thank you. Thank Very you.